Right, garage in state of disarray, neighbours mowing their lawn, definitely time to film a video. So we're going to look at how to make these today. This is a super lightweight baseboard that you can texture however you like. I'll be doing roads and uh, it does involve a little bit of woodworking, but I'm going to do it with tools that I've got, circular saw, etc. And the most basics, a handsaw. Let's get to it. Right, step one was to cut out these uh, boy baseboards. They're made out of hardboard. Uh, always wear a respirator if you're cutting any form of uh, wood material. Uh, it's very thin at three mil, which is why we're gonna give it some strength with some battens. So these can easily be cut with a handsaw or a chop saw, etc., cetera. Um, and they will go around the outside. Like on this example, you can see inside the foam, it gives it a lot of structure and rigidity. I cannot bend this if I try. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna line this. So this has been cut uh, with a circular saw um, to the size of a kill team uh, board tile, which is 22 by 30 inches, um, so they can butt up against each other for all different size games. And what I've done is cut it with a circular saw, but you can cut this with a utility knife uh, if you're very careful. Get a nice sharp blade, uh, safety reminder to be very careful with these blades. Um, I had a little bit of a mishap. Um, and you cut these board tiles out and I would batch them so that they're exactly the same size. Use a very strong straight edge, either something like um, a level or I've got my own aluminium one and cut them out nice and square edged. Right after that, what we're gonna do is recess the screws so they don't split anything. So use a board like this and we'll use this to draw around to make a mark. Right, so the one tool you are going to need for this is probably going to be a power drill. Uh, get a corded one, they're cheap. If you've got a battery powered one like this, that's great. They are not scary. And if you're careful with them, they're not dangerous. So we're going to use a countersink bit. So that's this pointy one here. And what this is going to do is drill a cone-shaped recess in the board. So I'm placing these close to the edge here in the middle of the line that I've drawn so I know where the batten's going to be underneath. And they're centered approximately six inches apart to give a good strong bond between the wood underneath and the board on top. Okay, next up is cutting the battens. And you can see I've bat cut, batch cut all the ones that I need uh, for the project. Uh, but to show you what I'm gonna do is lay this up against the board and we'll start on one edge and we will make sure it's flush at this end by using your finger and then holding it firmly down, use a pencil to mark exactly where the edge of the board is here and make the mark very, very obvious. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut just inside of this line, uh, whether you're using a circular saw or a hand saw. And this makes sure that you are just within the region of the edge of the board because this is the top playing surface and you want this to butt up against the next one on this edge. You don't want something sticking out that's gonna leave you with a gap on the top surface. So having them half a mil or a mil back will give you the strength and it'll make sure that they butt up nicely. Okay, if you're using any sort of power saw, so I'm using a miter saw here or a chop saw, you wanna set up a stop block over here to the length that you need so that you can put the piece in here, slide it up against the stop block and accurately cut the same size piece each time over and over and batch them out. If you're gonna use a hand tool, what we need is a carpenter square. Right, so we've got our work piece with our cut mark here to make sure we cut it square because the chop saw and miter saw will cut exactly 90 degrees. If you're cutting with a hand saw, you don't want to go wibbly wobbly. So what we do is we use a carpenter square. So this is an ancient one that was my grandfather's, but any old one will do. And you line it up with the mark and you draw a straight line. And that tells you this way where your straight line is for your 90 degree corner. But you want to make sure you're cutting downwards in a 90 degree as well so that it's not bending in or out. Um, so what you do is line up set square or the carpenter square with the top line and then draw another one here and then you repeat this around the piece and if you've done a good job they'll all match up at the end to give you a very square mark of exactly where to cut and then when we look at cutting with a handsaw we'll cut across this mark and we'll use this one and this one to make sure that from the top down we're not wibbling this way or wibbling that way. Right, so taking a regular hand saw, you want the cut mark to be over slightly on the edge of the table to support the piece uh, that you're working on. And you wanna have the piece that you're gonna keep on the table and the scrap fall off. And what you wanna do is, if this is your piece that you're keeping, you wanna make sure you're cutting right on the line so you can just see it getting nicked away by the saw because this saw is approximately two mil thick one to two mil thick, it's called the kerf of the saw. This is material that you'll lose. And if you try and cut down the line, you'll end up losing slightly uh, amount of material off this side. In this case, it won't be so bad because it will just bring it in from the edge, but it's uh, carpentry basics. 
And using this method of looking top down, you're going to make sure you get a nice square edge on your piece so that it's not wonky uh, when it comes to using it on the baseboard. Right, this next step, you really want to be working on a flat surface because we're going to use that flatness to make sure everything stays how it should be. So I've got my two battens here. Uh, out of interest, these are 18 mil uh, thick by 28 mil, um, and they're going to go underneath. Um, so what we'll do is we've used our line here to make sure everything's lined up, and we put a bead of glue across the top and then smooth it out. And I'm using here a uh, wood adhesive. You can use PVA glue if that's what you have because this is not going to take all of the stress because we are going to use some screws. Right, and I'm now tucking it under the baseboard on my work surface, keeping that nice and level um, and putting it down here. And you can already see that the wood on top is starting to bow and this is something that we definitely don't want. So take your second piece that you cut for the other side and tuck it underneath uh, about two thirds of the way down the board and that will raise it up so that everything stays level. And what we do is we will now double check for flushness with your thumb or your finger to make sure that they're lined up at both the ends and along this face. If it bows slightly, because sometimes these, board, these um, wooden boards are likely to bow out slightly, make sure the bow is on the inside. And then as we screw along, so we'll anchor this one where it's correct here, we'll then bend the board slightly to get as flush as possible, put the next screw in. Right, as I mentioned, 28 millimeters of board, three millimeters of top. In this case, use whatever you can get. I'm going to use uh, 30 mil screws so that it doesn't protrude through the bottom when you start to screw it together, because I want this to sit level with the surface so it doesn't interfere with whatever I'm putting over the top. Uh, you can use a, your drill here if you've got an electric drill that you've used. All you've got to do is change the bit to a driver bit. I'm going to use an impact driver. Again, you don't need these fancy tools. A regular screwdriver, uh, once you've pre-drilled some pilot holes, would work. Okay, now we're here with this completed on both sides. We know the exact distance in here. So what I did was placed a board I'm going to cut in here, uh, made a pencil mark here, uh, cut it along the pencil mark to make sure that I remove the exact amount of material, in fact just slightly more, so that what we don't do is inadvertently put too thick a piece in here, too wide a piece in here, and bow the whole board, because then you're going to get different sizes. So you want it to be an exact fit, so leave a small gap. And then once I was sure that was correct, I set up a new stop block and cut all my pieces. Quick tip when gluing end grain, uh, because it's basically like a giant straw uh, all the way down the wood piece, uh, put some glue on, come back in a minute, and then put a little bit more on because it will soak it all up and you want to make sure there's enough there. So uh, make sure you put on two thin coats. Right, eagle-eyed amongst you will notice there's no screw in the corner, which is usually where you'd want to anchor something, but there's plenty of glue. Um, and that is because I want to leave space for a screw to go in from this side to pin everything together, and I don't want it interfering with where these are. But what we've got to do is, because this is a narrow board here, we don't want to put a screw in here and it's split, um, and we're close to the edge of the board here, so again, we don't want it to split this way. So we will drill a small pilot hole uh, with the drill, nice and easy. Let me drive one of the same screws in there and jobs are good one. Right, all glued and screwed up and the next thing to do is to fill that gap. I mean you could just use it as is but it's got a little bit of flex to it. So oddly polystyrene is what I'm going to use to fill this up. It is not on its own very durable but when we bond it along the entire surface here it's going to give it a lot of rigidity and it weighs absolutely nothing. And if you really want to get fancy and cut into your board like for craters, uh, rivers etc having this underneath uh, is something you can easily cut into and remove um, as I've done on previous projects involving rivers. So I will be getting two boards to cut and fit in here. Right, absolutely nothing fancy here. So we're just gonna line the boards up uh, with what fits in this gap. Mark it with a Sharpie, again, slightly under, and then cut it. Right, I've been a massive fan of using polyurethane expanding glue in the past, but uh, unless uh, you have speed as a massive issue. Um, I'm now switching over to these grab adhesives that for, for um, uh, construction. Uh, they are significantly cheaper and they don't go off anywhere near as much as a polyurethane glue, which I found uh, I never got through an entire bottle, so it's a bit of a waste. So we're going to squeeze a load of this out, use something flat and scrappy to spread it out, and pop the polystyrene in the top. Right, and there we go. I wanted to get 25 mil um, 
battens so that they match the thickness of my polystyrene, but they don't quite. You can see there's a three mil gap. There were some uh, supply issues uh, in the UK at the moment for various reasons. So what I've actually got is a three mil sheet of underlay um, to finish it off. So I will be cutting and fitting this at the last stage and that'll make it an exact flush fit um, so that if I want to leave it as is, I can do. Um, or if I want to put another board on top to sandwich it in between the hardboard, which is probably what I'll do, um, this fills up the gaps nicely. If you're gonna sandwich it, if this is your playing surface, make sure the surface that you put the hardboard on here is not exactly the same size. You want it to be about a millimeter short, so there's nothing sticking out beyond the game surface um, to butt up against each other, and then you get a really nice fit. All right, so this is a demo piece, of course, for the video, but it's one of the boards that I'll be using. So I'm gonna leave it to dry now. Uh, what I would do if I was batching these out is I would actually just get the other board sections that you've made, like this, stack them on top of each other because making sure that there's no glue showing so you don't stick your boards together. Uh, and in order to keep everything nice and square, I do it like this. I'm gonna put a big piece of MDF or board on top and then I'll put a couple of paint cans on to weigh the whole thing down and leave it for something like six to eight hours for that stuff to dry. If you get the solvent based uh, grab adhesive, uh, it takes a couple of hours. And if you are using polyurethane glue and you've used the water and all the expanding stuff, um, it's something like 30 to 45 minutes. So if you're in a rush, that is the one. It's just a uh, dollar dollar. Right, that's our baseboards done. As I said, super lightweight. They don't flex at all. Very easy to stack and store. I'm gonna be texturing mine with some roads, which I'll be doing in a separate video because it's not necessarily relevant. If you wanna put different things in there, you can put flocks, sand, grass mat. You can have them just like this to put on top of your dining table in order to make a gaming surface you roll a mat out on. Lots of options. They weigh nothing, they store in a cupboard easy, and uh, they're quite affordable to make compared to, I don't know, a plastic company that makes giant ones that are very expensive. And if you're a little unsure about woodworking, it's super easy. The only real tool you need is a saw, hand saw would work, and a drill, um, which is a fairly common tool. They're not that expensive. And if you've thought about getting into any sort of woodworking or building, cannot recommend woodworking for mere mortals enough as a channel. Uh, Steve is the best at making all these things seem very approachable and easy. Um, so tune in next time uh, where we're gonna tackle the surfacing.